for seven fantastic days in August 2005. We cruised along one of the mightiest and longest rivers in the world, the River Nile, from Luxor south to Aswan and back. Our home for the week was the 35 cabined Viking 3. We soon got into the relaxing swing of shipborne life, sitting on the upper deck watching the world go by. As the sun began to set on our first evening, we settled down over a cold drink to take in the sights and sounds of Luxor. By Egyptian standards, Luxor is a modern city, built up on the proceeds of tourism since the Roman times, which has given the local shopkeepers plenty of experience in how to separate the tourists from their money. Luxor, Al-Aqsa in Arabic, was the ancient Egyptian capital known as Thebes, the greatest capital of Egypt during the New Kingdom and the glorious city of the god Amun-Ra. Luxor has been called the world's greatest open-air museum, as indeed it is and much more. The number and preservation of the monuments in the Luxor area are unparalleled. Next morning we board our coach for our first excursion to the spectacular West Bank Temple at Deir al-Bahri. Deir al-Bahri in Arabic Adair al-Bahri literally meaning the northern monastery is a complex of mortuary temples and tombs located on the west bank of the Nile opposite the city of Luxor. As the temple faces east the structure is likely to be connected with the sun cult of Ra and the resurrection of the king. The focal point of the Deir el-Bahri complex is the Jessa Jesseru, meaning the Holy of Holies. It is a colonnaded structure which was designed and implemented by Senemut, royal steward and architect of Hatshepsut, to serve for a posthumous worship and to honor the glory of our moon. Jessa Jesseru sits atop a series of colonnaded terraces reached by long ramps that once were graced with spectacular gardens and avenues of sphinx and is built into a cliff face that rises sharply above it. These restored statues on the uppermost level are depicting Hatshepsut wearing a false beard and the twin crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. It's believed that the statues were damaged after a death under the orders of Thutmos III as an act of revenge for depriving him of what he considered as his rightful status as the true Pharaoh. For the first time in Egyptian art, text and a pictorial cycle tell of the divine birth of the female pharaoh Hatshepsut and her autobiography, including stories of a fabled trip to the land of Punt, considered by some scholars likely to be what is today Eritrea or Somalia. Today, the terrace of Deir al-Bahri only conveys a faint impression of the original intentions of Senemut. All the statue ornaments are missing, the statues of Osiris in front of the pillars of the upper colonnade, 
the Sphinx Avenue in front of the court and the standard sitting and kneeling figures of the Queen. All were destroyed in a posthumous condemnation of the female pharaoh. To the north of Deir el-Bahri lies the Valley of the Kings. In Arabic, Wadi Biban el-Maluk, Gates of the King. Here, for a period of nearly 500 years from the 16th to the 11th century BC, tombs were constructed for the kings and powerful nobles of the new kingdom. In modern times the valley has become famous for the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun with its rumor of the curse of the pharaohs and is one of the most famous archaeological sites in the world. The Theban hills are dominated by the peak of Al-Khum, known to the ancient Egyptians as Tar de Hedent. It has a pyramid-shaped appearance and is considered to have been the reason why the kings of Egypt started to be buried beneath it. Its isolated position resulted in reduced access and special tomb police, the Medjai, were able to guard the necropolis. The valley was used for primary burials from approximately 1539 BC to 1075 BC and contains at least 63 tombs, beginning with the I and ending with Ramesses the 10th or 11th. A few miles south lies the Valley of the Queens. The Valley of the Queens, also known as Biban el Harim, is where the wives of pharaohs were buried. In ancient times, it was known as Taset Neferu, meaning the place of the children of the pharaoh. Because along with the queens of the 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties, Many princes and princesses were also buried with various members of the nobility. The tombs of these individuals were maintained by mortuary priests who performed daily rituals and provided offerings and prayers for the deceased nobility. This necropolis is said to hold more than 70 tombs many of which are stylish and lavishly decorated. The Colossi of Memnon, known to locals as El Colossat or Es Salamat, are two massive stone statues of Pharaoh Amenhotep III. For the past 3,400 years, they have stood in the Theban necropolis. The twin statues depict Amenhotep III in a seated position, his hands resting on his knees and his gaze turned eastwards towards the river Nile and the rising sun. The statues are made from blocks of quartzite sandstone. When constructed, including the stone platforms on which they stood, they reached a towering 18 meters, around 60 feet in height. Returning to the boat, we stop at a perfume factory, where we learn and see how the beautiful Egyptian perfume bottles are made. We listen to how Egypt exports the essence used to make perfume all around the world to companies such as Chanel and Dior. And then, in Egyptian style, comes the big sell. Uh, this is number 28. One kind for men. This is the biggest launch of cool water, David, of four men. Men's one, cool water, David. Access to the Temple of Luxor 
was and still is for the thousands of tourists who flock there every day from the north where the causeway lined by many hundred sphinx once led all the way to the mighty Karnak temple over three kilometers away The temple proper begins with the 79 foot high first pylon built by Ramesses II. The pylon was decorated with scenes of Ramesses' military triumphs. Later pharaohs, particularly those of the Nubian and Ethiopian dynasties, also recorded their victories here. This main entrance to the temple complex was originally flanked by six colossal statues of Ramesses, four seated and two standing, but only two both seated have survived. Modern visitors can also see the 82 foot tall pink granite obelisk. It is one of a matching pair. The other was given as a gift to a French king and taken to Paris in 1835, where it now stands in the center of the Place de la Concorde. Luxor Temple is known in Arabic as Ipat Risyat, or the Southern Sanctuary. The temple was dedicated to the Theban triad of gods, Amun, Mut and Chons, and was built during the New Kingdom in 1400 BC. The pylon gateway leads into a peristyle courtyard, also built by Ramesses II. This area and the pylon were built at an oblique angle to the rest of the temple presumably to accommodate the three pre-existing bark shrines located in the northwest corner. The main part of the temple, the colonnade and the sun court, were built by Amenhotep III and a later addition by Ramesses II. Surrounding the courtyard are massive statues of Ramesses II interrupted by papyrus columns. It is atop the columns of this courtyard that the Abu Hagag Mosque was built on the eastern side. A doorway leads surrealistically out into thin air some 26 feet above the ground. After the peristyle courtyard comes the processional colonnade built by Amenhotep III. A 328 feet long corridor lined by 14 papyrus capital columns. Beyond the colonnade is another peristyle courtyard which also dates back to Amenhotep's original construction. Here also sits a statue of the young King Tutankhamun and his wife. The southern side of this courtyard is made up of a 32 column hyperstyle court that leads into the inner sanctums of the temple. To the rear of the temple are chapels built by Tutmosis III and Alexander the Great. These begin with a dark antechamber. Of particular interest here are the Roman staccatos that can still be seen atop the Egyptian carvings below. In Roman times, this area served as a chapel where local Christians were offered a final opportunity to renounce their faith and embrace the state religion. Moving further in stands a bark shrine for use by Amun, built by Alexander with the final area being the private quarters of the gods and the birth shrine 
of Amenhotep III. His divine origin is depicted in careful, touching detail on the walls. One sight not to be missed is the Luxor Museum of Antiquities. Inaugurated in 1975, the museum is housed in a small purpose-built building. The range of artifacts on display are far more restricted than the country's main collections in the Museum of Antiquities in Cairo. This was, however, deliberate since the museum prides itself on the quality of the pieces it has, the uncluttered way in which they are displayed, and the clear multilingual labelling used. Among the most striking items on show are grave goods from the tomb of Tutankhamun and a collection of 26 exceptionally well-preserved New Kingdom statues that were found buried in a cache in nearby Luxor Temple in 1989. Two of the most striking items are the mummified remains of Ramesses I and his son, the greatest pharaoh of them all, Ramesses II. In the afternoon, we arrived at the magnificent temple of Karnak. Karnak is one of the premier sites in all of Egypt, and one of the most visited. Although badly ruined, no site in Egypt is more impressive than Karnak. The key difference between Karnak and most of the other temple sites in Egypt is the length of time over which it was developed and used. Construction of temples started in the Middle Kingdom and continued through to Ptolemaic times. Approximately 30 pharaohs contributed to the buildings. It is the largest temple complex ever built by man and represents the combined achievement of many generations of ancient builders. The temple of Karnak is actually three main temples, with the precinct of Amun-Ra being the only one open to the public. There are many smaller enclosed temples and several outer temples, all located about three kilometers north of Luxor. Karnak is actually the site's modern name. Its ancient name was Ipat Isut, meaning the most select or sacred of places. Today, visitors normally approach the temple from the west by way of a quay built by Ramesses II, which gave access to the temple from a canal, which during ancient times was linked to the Nile. A short avenue of cryosphinx leads from the key to the temple's first pylon. These cryosphinx have ram's heads symbolizing the great state god Amun, and each holds a statue of the king protectively between their paws. The huge entrance pylon is actually unfinished, as attested by the unequal heights of its upper regions, the uncut blocks which project from its undecorated surfaces, and the remains of the mud brick construction ramp that is still present on its interior side. Passing through this pylon, the first courtyard now encloses an area that was originally outside of the temple, as evidenced by a number of cryosphinx, like those outside, that were displaced from their original position along the processional route. 
Inside this courtyard, to the left, is the granite and sandstone triple bark chapel of Sete II. Opposite this shrine is a small sphinx with the features of Tutankhamun. Thanks to the magic of animation and the Egyptology department of UCLA, we can take a virtual flight into the temple's first court for a look at what hasn't been seen for 2,500 years. The second pylon was begun during the reign of Horemheb, the last ruler of the 18th dynasty and completed during the reign of Sete I. The second pylon opens into the famous Great Hyperstyle Hall, which is one of the most impressive areas in the whole of the Karnak Temple complex with its towering columns. There are a total of 134 papyrus columns, including 12 in the center, which are taller than the others. They measure about 69 feet high, while the 122 others measure 49 feet. At one time these columns supported a roof with small windows. While the roof is gone, some of the windows remain. They would have provided a muted illumination for the interior. Once again, we can jump back in time to imagine what the hole would have looked like. The hole was begun by Amenhotep III. However, the decorations were initiated by Sete I and completed by Ramesses II. Within the hall, the decorations show scenes from the daily ritual and also processional scenes, as well as mythical topics such as the king's interaction with various gods. Amenhotep III initiated the third pylon, though its entrance porch is part of the later Ramesid period. Beyond this pylon is the obelisk court, where four such structures were erected by Tutmosis I and III. This obelisk stands almost 22 meters in height, including the pedestal, which is 1.8 meters square. Most estimates place its weight between 128 and 143 tons. The obelisk is made of red granite. The remains of two long lost obelisks of Hatshepsut are found a short distance away. One now standing with the upper part of the southern obelisk broken into pieces. It is mounted on concrete blocks in the proximity of the sacred lake. To the south of the girdle wall of Ramses II is a rectangular sacred lake dug by Tutmosis III. It is the largest of its kind that is known of and is lined with stone and provided with stairways descending into the water. It measures some 393 feet by 252 feet. It is believed that most temple precincts included a sacred lake. Water from the lake, filled with groundwater, was used by the priests for ritual ablutions and other temple needs and was also home to the sacred geese of our moon. As Ra, the sun god, leaves, Yah, the moon god, takes his place. To see the temple of Karnak from a different perspective, a visit to the nightly sound and light show was a must.
May the evening soothe and welcome you, O oh, traveler from Upper Egypt. You will travel no further, because you are come. Here, you are at the beginning of time. Here was conceived and lived the great week of the creation of the world and the separation of the earth from the water. You are at the house of the Father. In this house of the Father, each pharaoh thought of himself as a son and wished to leave his mark upon it. Each added, superimposed, overdid, outdid, through a span of 20 centuries. The result is this fabulous labyrinth of facades and passages, esplanades and corridors, perspectives and detours to which only priests and pharaoh had access. It has been said that Thebes was the first city, the city of cities. Homer named it the city of a hundred gates. For a hundred trumpets sounded its name. of which you have come to dream, for one can only understand by dreaming. This mirror set in the rock has reflected the finest firework display of antiquity. A dazzling gleam that has lasted 20 centuries. As soon as one cluster of stars faded, another pharaoh fired another salvo. May these hieroglyphics come to life once more to bid farewell to you new pilgrims to our region. Like a sudden flight of a myriad sacred birds, their spread wings sprinkling the droplets of the river like a benediction. Slipping our moorings the next morning, we sailed south down the Nile passing some beautiful countryside as we lazed on deck or in the pool. The tranquil peace every now and again was shattered as we passed another cruise ship while the captain seemed to have a little game to see who had the best ship's horn. Later we came upon the oldest cruise ship on the Nile, the venerable old Sudan. Built at the end of the 1800s, Sedan was to become a film star. Agatha Christie took a cruise on the old steam paddle ship, which impressed her so much she wrote Death on the Nile, with a plot based around the ship. When the book was made into a film, it was shot on board. In the early evening, we closed on Esna where ships must wait for transit through two massive locks. With 300 Nile cruise ships, the locks cause massive congestion. While the ships wait to be called through, local entrepreneurs seize the moment and in typical Egyptian style, if you can't get to the shops, they'll bring the shops to you. Just after midnight, we started to inch our way through the lock. All Nile ships are a standard 14 meters wide. With the lock only 15 meters, half a meter space each side isn't much at all, especially in the dark. However, we pass through safely and next morning find ourselves alongside Esna town. Cruise boats often make this town their first port of call after leaving Luxor 
to visit the remains of the Ptolemaic temple in the center of the town. The ancient name for Esna was Lonyin or Tarsanet. The temple is dedicated to the ram-headed god Knum, the god of creation. Tutmosis III laid the foundations of the temple in the 18th dynasty. But Ptolemaic and Roman emperors from 40 to 250 AD completed it. It is one of the last temples built in Egypt and stands today in its excavation pit nine meters below the modern ground level. While all that remains of the temple is the great hypostyle hall, the roof of the hypostyle hall is still intact, supported by 24 columns, each with varied floral capitals. There are 16 different palm and plant capitals on the columns, some still with excellent color. The walls are covered with four rows of reliefs showing Ptolemaic and Roman emperors dressed in pharaoh costumes. Leaving Esna in the late afternoon, we sail ever southwards, watching Egyptian daily life unfold before us. Early next morning, we arrive at the sleepy town of Edfu. Edfu has the second largest temple in Egypt after Karnak and undoubtedly the best preserved. The entire temple was covered by the desert sands. The sand has helped to preserve the building which was found to be almost completely intact when it was first cleared and excavated by Auguste Mariette in the 1860s. The temple dedicated to the falcon god Horus was built in the Ptolemaic period between 237 and 57 BC. Carvings on the massive twin towers of the 118 foot high entrance pylon are almost mirror images of each other with the traditional scenes of the king smiting his enemies before Horus. Within the pylons is the colonnaded courtyard with distinctive paired columns which lead into the great hyperstyle hall. Ahead is the main temple facade, in front of which stands the famous colossal black granite statue of Horus as a falcon, wearing the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. The facade has screen walls with engaged columns in the usual style of late period and Ptolemaic temples. This is the outer hyperstyle hall of Praneos, with 18 tall carved columns to support a ceiling decorated with astronomical figures representing the sky. The usual offering scenes decorate the walls, but there are also well-preserved reliefs from the temple foundation ceremony. The second hyperstyle hall, the Naos or Great Court, is older and smaller than the Praneus. The ceiling is supported by 12 slender columns. This hyperstyle has a number of chambers leading off to each side. Next we come to the Holy of Holies, the Sanctuary which was the most sacred area of the temple. The sanctuary contains the oldest object in the temple, a granite Naos shrine, which would have contained the cult statue of Horus. In a chapel behind the sanctuary, 
there is a low pedestal on which stands a reproduction of the bark or ceremonial barge of Horus. Around the inner temple is an ambulatory or corridor carved with more foundation and building text and also scenes from the Edfu drama The Triumph of Horus that tells the story of Horus's mythological triumph over Seth which was celebrated each year as a mystery play. We sailed overnight and much of the next day before arriving at Kom Ombo in the late afternoon. Kom Ombo is one of the smallest and arguably prettiest of the Nile temples, sitting as it does on a low plateau overlooking the great river Nile. The temple of Komombo is an unusual double temple built during the rule of the Ptolemaic dynasty. One side of the temple is dedicated to the crocodile god Sobek, the god of fertility and creator of the world. The other side is dedicated to the falcon god Heriurus also known as Horus the Elder. The stone color differs from that of all the other temples, perhaps because it was covered with sand for so long. Much of the temple has been destroyed by the Nile, earthquakes and later builders who used the stones for other projects. One of the finest high reliefs in the temple is that of Ptolemy XII receiving the waters of purification from the gods Horus and Thot. The first hyperstyle hall has three transverse rows of fine bundled columns, each with a bill capital. The ceiling is decorated with astronomical scenes and the vulture, the symbol of Nekvet and Ujet. The calendar here at Komombo is thought to be the oldest in the world. The Egyptian calendar was divided into 365 days, 12 30-day months and one five-day month. Depicted in hieroglyphics on a wall leading to the sanctuary are engravings of what is thought to be the first representation of medical instruments for performing surgery, including scalpels, curettes, forceps, dilator, scissors and medicine bottles dating from the days of the Roman Egypt. With the sun setting, we made our way back to the ship. Tonight was to be our Galabea party. The Galabea is a tunic worn by Egyptian men. Everyone on the ship dressed in the Egyptian style for a night of belly dancing competitions and party games. Overnight we sailed to Aswan, Egypt's third city behind Cairo and Alexandria. Aswan is the ancient city of Swenet, which was in antiquity the frontier town of Egypt. It is perhaps the most scenic city on the Nile, and in Aswan the River Nile is at its most beautiful. It lies roughly 900 kilometers south of Cairo on the borders of Nubia, only 30 miles from Sudan. There is something unique about an Egyptian souk which makes them unlike any others in Arabia. Maybe it's the sounds, sights and smells of herbs and spices that invades your senses 
or perhaps just the very friendly people. I thankfully visited this market on the Friday Sabbath, so the normally bustling crowds were not present. I have mentioned the Ptolemies and the Ptolemaic period many times in this video. The Ptolemies were a Greek royal family which ruled Egypt for almost 300 years from 305 BC to 30 BC. They were the 32nd and last dynasty of ancient Egypt. After lunch a short drive brought us to Philae where we were to board small boats to take us to the penultimate temple of our week. By 1960 UNESCO had decided to move many of the endangered sites along the Nile to safer ground. Philae's temple complex was moved piece by piece to the island of Aguila, 550 meters away, where it was reassembled and remains today. The main temple is dedicated to Isis and was the center of the cult of Isis and Hathor during the Roman period. It was the last pagan temple in use in Egypt. The island was so scenic it was called the Pearl of Egypt. In bloom as it was when we visited, I can see why. Beginning at the south of the island, Nectanebo's structure is a hall with screen walls linked by graceful columns. There are two colonnades on the east and west sides of the courtyard. This leads to the first temple pylon. The first pylon was built by Ptolemy XII and decorated in traditional Egyptian style with reliefs of the king subduing his enemies and worshipping the goddess Isis. On the eastern side of the inner court is another colonnade with a number of chambers behind it. In front of the second pylon, the natural outcrop of rock on which it was built was smooth to create a donation stela recording lands donated to the temple by Ptolemy VI. The second pylon leads to the hyperstyle hall. The hyperstyle hall is small and unassuming compared to some of the other temples from this period. A series of three vestibules lead to the central sanctuary. The Isis sanctuary still contains a pedestal where the sacred bark used in the processions and festivals of the goddess would have rested. Leaving the temple by a doorway in the eastern side we visit the small temple of Hathor, built by Ptolemy VI and VIII, with its Ptolemaic papyrus columns. Nearby is the kiosk of Trajan, probably the most distinctive of Philae's monuments. Reliefs inside the rectangular structure of 14 columns with screen walls depict the Emperor Trajan making offerings to Isis. The roof is now gone and the kiosk which was at one time the main entrance to the temple from the river is airy and open. We had a couple of stops on the way back to our ship. The first was to the world famous Aswan High Dam. It was considered an engineering miracle when it was constructed in the 1960s. The dam is 11,811 feet long, 3,215 feet wide at its base and 364 feet tall. Today it provides electricity 
and irrigation for the whole of Egypt. The lake created by the dam is some 500 miles long. Our second stop was to a granite quarry. The granite quarries of ancient Aswan lay beside the Nile, thus providing easy access to boats for transporting this prized building stone to sites downstream. A crack in the granite stopped the cutting of what would have been an enormous obelisk, estimated at more than 40 meters high. Now, the abandoned, partially carved obelisk gives us much information about how ancient stonecutters worked. The heat reflecting back from the granite was unbearable. To work the stone in this heat must literally have been a killer. Back on the ship after dinner, we had the treat of a Nubian folk night. Complete with an authentic belly dance, Nubian dancers and a demonstration of what spurned the phrase whirling dervish. The highlight of the trip for me was a visit to Abu Simbel. Abu Simbel comprises two massive rock temples in southern Egypt on the western bank of Lake Nasser. It's about 290 kilometers southwest of Aswan. The twin temples were originally carved out of the mountainside during the reign of Pharaoh Ramesses II in the 13th century BC as a lasting monument to himself and his queen Nefertari. However, the complex was relocated in its entirety in the 1960s on an artificial hill made from a domed structure. The relocation of the temple was necessary to avoid being submerged during the creation of Lake Nasser, the massive artificial water reservoir formed after the building of the Aswan Dam on the River Nile. It was dedicated to the gods Amun-Ra, Ra Harakti and Ptah, as well as to the deified Ramesses himself. It is generally considered the grandest and most beautiful of the temples commissioned during the reign of Ramesses II and one of the most beautiful in Egypt. Ramesses himself came here and opened the temples. Five years later, a savage earthquake damaged the second statue. Ramesses was never told and went to his grave not knowing his great temple had been damaged. All statues represent Ramesses II, seated on a throne and wearing the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. Between his feet are statues of his wife Nefertari and his daughters. Above the entrance is the god Ra in human form, shown with a falcon's head and the sun disk behind him. Inside the hyperstyle hall, sometimes also called the Proneus, is 18 meters long and 16.7 meters wide and is supported by eight huge Osirid pillars depicting the deified Ramesses linked to the god Osiris. The colossal statues along the left-hand wall 
bear the white crown of Upper Egypt, while those on the opposite side are wearing the double crown. The bas reliefs on the walls of the Perneus depict battle scenes in the military campaigns the ruler waged. Much of the sculpture is given to the Battle of Kadesh. This hall gives access to a transverse vestibule in the middle of which is the entrance to the sanctuary. Here on a black wall a rock cut out sculptures of four seated figures. From the right Raharakti, the deified King Ramesses and the gods Amun-Ra and Ptah. The temple of Hathor and Nefertari, also known as the Small Temple, was built about 100 meters northeast of the temple of Ramesses II and was dedicated to the goddess Hathor and Ramesses II's chief consort Nefertari. This was in fact the first time in ancient Egyptian history that a temple was dedicated to a queen. The statues, slightly more than 10 meters high, are of the king and his queen. What is truly surprising is that for the first and only time in Egyptian art, the statues of the king and his consort are equal in size. Inside this second temple are many images of the female gods such as Isis and Hathor, as well as scenes with Ramesses and Nefertari making offerings to the gods. We make the most of the next day, relaxing on our last full day in Egypt as we sailed back northwards to Luxor, contemplating all we had seen and experienced over the last seven days. There is something about the air in Egypt that makes every sunset a one to remember and we remember all of them. Salam Aleikum.